This is Just a Few Questions. I'm Mark Sims. My guest is Raymond Lopez. Raymond Lopez is the alder person or alderman from the 15th Ward here in the city of Chicago. Welcome to the show, Raymond Lopez. Mark, thank you, sir. I'm so tickled here. I was, we were talking off the air. I said, let me quit talking off the air. Let's, let's, do, let's save the energy for the show. So let's get right into it. Uh, Raymond Lopez, here's the question. Did you like working for Southwest Airlines more than you like being older person, older <laughs> man of the 15th Ward? You know, I love being alderman, but yes, it was a, a, a real moment for me to decide if I needed, if I was going to give up working for the airline that I loved. And I really loved working for Southwest Airlines. I love being a skycap. I love the culture of the company 20 years ago that was always customer first. It was always take care of the person in front of you first. Everything else was second. And I miss that. And I think people miss that even now in Southwest because the company's changed since I've left. Not because I left, but it definitely has changed since I left. Um, but there's something about being able to help people in that moment um, when they're in front of you and being a part of their life for that for those few moments that they that you got them. And I think that's actually what helped me transition when I became Alderman was that I brought that same love affair with helping people to my job as Alderman. You know, sometimes when people are elected Alderman, they their head expands and their doors have to be widened so they could get into the conference rooms. I really felt that you have to take ownership of people's problems and you have to be able to want to see it from start to finish. And that is something that I've done as alderman in the 15th Ward over these three terms that I've been elected. It's something that is, uh, I think has been refreshingly brought back to the southwest side, an infusion of customer service and public service. And even now you see um, from Johnson to Lightfoot to Rahm, this concept that I've been able to bring in about treating people as customers, not just taxpayers, has has really taken hold within city government. And I think that is something that I definitely have brought to the table over these nearly 10 years in public service. Well, here's the question I'm, well, I brought you here for. And the first one, too. I like the first question. Uh, Alderman Lopez, how can Mayor Brandon Johnson help you dramatically reduce neighborhood crime in the 15th war. Man, I'd rather go back to talking about airlines. <laughs> but I think that, um, look, we know crime is an issue in the city of Chicago. We know that generational gang violence is a real thing in many of our communities. We know that in many communities where you have 70% unemployment for males 18 to 24, they're going to survive somehow if we do not do not create opportunities in neighborhoods. We know this. And if Mayor Johnson wants to truly be impactful about addressing the violence, you need to, one, call it out, two, call out those who are committed to it, and three, be able to provide real alternatives for those who are trapped in these cycles of violence that have no other end but death. We're not getting that from Mayor Johnson right now. We're getting a lot of platitudes, a lot of gaslighting, blaming Richard Nixon, and funding a lot of the poverty pimps and grief peddlers that have no real interest in seeing an end to the violence in our neighborhoods. And I think we all know who those characters are. That is not a sustainable plan if your true goal is to address and end violence in the city of Chicago. Recently, we had a situation in my ward in particular where a father and son were in front of their house fixing their son's car and gangbangers came up and shot them in cold blood in front of their house. Me, my, my reaction is to call out the gangs, identify and work with a community to see who has cameras, who has information, and to get that to the police so that we could have our detectives track down the perpetrators and bring them to justice. To, to break that cycle and get those individuals off the street and to give hope to communities that by working together, we can get some of the bad guys out of our neighborhoods. But that's not the plan that the mayor espoused. And actually, I'm looking at his five-point plan that he get sent to my office as a result of the shooting. And it says, assist the immediate victims, which we already do. It talks about keeping the surrounding community safe by working with our anti-violence programmers, support healthy living, communicate with stakeholders, and then talk about next steps. 
Nowhere in his plan does it talk about working with police. Does it talk about calling out the gang violence? Does it talk about those key things that we know are what drove us to having this situation in my community? And that is something that has been repeated time and time again, weekend after weekend in the city of Chicago since he's been in office and in fairness before he was in office. But we have to have a mayor who calls it out, who's willing to stand up and say the quiet part out loud and point the finger at those who are doing the bad things in our communities. That's what I need. That's what Chicago needs. And if the mayor's unwilling to do that, we're just going to continue to see the blame game spin around and around while the body count continues to rise. Well, now, as you well know, and everyone knows, or they should know, only about, what, 1, 2, 3 percent of the residents of any ward of the, let's do the 15th ward. You know the ward better than I do. Uh, only about a few percentage of people in the neighborhood, in that 15th ward, cause a lot of crime. Why can't the city of Chicago find these men and some of these teenagers and, and these men and some older men to find these men and, and give, them, give them a – well, I didn't want to go there. I'll go there. <laughs> you go there. Out, I, mean, I, know, I know. I didn't want to go there. <laughs> but the point is that – yeah, I, I agree with you. The point is that get these people the supports they need, and if they refuse to get the supports they need, run them out of town. Why does the mayor get tough on crime or any mayor? Well, part of the reason that we don't do that or why many mayors have not done that is because oftentimes the money that could be allocated towards beefing up our detectives to putting rewards out on the street to bringing these individuals to justice to identifying and helping residents keep their community safe like through uh, camera progr rebate programs and such, that money is diverted towards many of these organizations that claim to be reducing violence in the neighborhoods who are also double dipping and serving as double agents, both in terms of reducing violence, but also still maintaining that lifestyle. That is never going to be in, bring violence down in the city of Chicago. And oftentimes it's those same organizations that many politicians, including our mayor, rely upon for their reelections. We need to break their stranglehold on this political process, because all we're doing is fueling a system that has failed rather than focusing on the live outcome, which would be a reduction in violence in the neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. In, the, in communities like the ones that I represent, take Back of the Yards, for example. There are about 12,000 people who live in the Back of the Yards that I represent, of which maybe 150 are in some way, shape, or form actively connected to gang life and the violence connected therein. We should be able to identify them, identify their troubled buildings, identify their, their, their houses where they hide their guns and drugs and focus solely on that and we could improve the entire community overnight. But we get lost in this effort of having to have organizations come in funded by taxpayers, propped up and expanded and allow them to have political missions that have nothing to do with reducing violence, but are supported by the politicians who claim to want to bring an end to the violence in the city of Chicago. That is an unhealthy addiction that is only serving to discredit the anti-violence movement, as well as dishearten residents from thinking that anything's ever going to change because they constantly hear about millions being sent and spent on violence reduction with no reduction in sight. Oh, yeah, I'm like... Yeah, I'm too scared to go there. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. I mean, I, I can't disagree with you, but you know the war better than I do. So and you are you're on the street. I'm hiding in a house on the far south side. OK, so you know what's really going on. But uh, let me say something. You did you attend Catholic schools from grammar school to high all through high school? I did. All right. So you didn't have the pleasure or the disservice of going to the Chicago public schools like you are truly. And I say that because Brandon Johnson was an organizer for the CPS. And I don't see the CPS or the Board of Education saying, hey, we can, and the teachers know this. And I'm doing this anecdotally, of course, anecdotally, of course. Mm -hmm. Everyone sees these troubled teens and these troubled uh, they become troubled men. And you say some women I hear who cause trouble. We see them coming. From from kindergarten, you know what I'm saying? They're on that road. They have, you know, why can't we cut them off at the pass and stop them from being uh, a neighborhood criminal? Or like I said, just literally running, running people out of town. You're not welcome here. You got to go. Well, I know that discipline is what is sorely lacking in Chicago public schools. 
And there's a very warped sense of discipline from what I knew as a Catholic school kid versus what CPS students learn today is discipline. Because if I did something wrong, not only did I get a few raps across the knuckles by the sisters or my teachers, my parents would be called in as well. And I would have to sit there until my parents came and got me. That doesn't happen in CPS. What we see now is a lot of excuse making and deflection. And in many cases, we see situations where school administrators will recognize the bully, recognize the gang recruitment, recognize the bad behaviors that we should be able to cut off and correct early on, but they don't say anything because they want to hold everything in house. They want to keep their numbers low for the Board of Education so that they don't have to report any situations or instances of violence or gang activity or bullying or harassment. And in trying to do that, they basically create an abscess within the school, a festering wound where that behavior grows upon itself. And it's ingrained in the students that there is no repercussions for my actions. And they learn that very early on. And for whatever reason, that seems to be the modus operandi of many of our teachers and administrators in CPS right now, because they are afraid of holding the parents accountable for the children and telling them that they have to be accountable. Now, I know, and people will often say, well, the, many of these children come from low-income families and all the usual talking points of deflection. I didn't come from a rich family. My family struggled to put me through Catholic school. But growing up poor or without a lot of money doesn't automatically relegate you to being a criminal. And people have to stop using that as the, the causation of criminality. The fact that we do not have repercussions at an early age is what emboldens a seven-year-old to become a 12-year-old shooter. Uh, I can talk. I can talk forever. Let me let me let me get on this soft uh, soapbox really quick. Then I'm gonna have you end the show with, with your final comments. I hope that people. I mean, maybe people don't know when they're a victim of crime, tragically, or just got mugged on the street or whatever. They they are they are uh, casualties of the system. The system yeah. allows uh, criminals to grow up and be criminals. So you're a casualty to system. And I don't know if people really understand that this system can change, but people have to speak out and, and demand change. So, yeah. Alderman Raymond Lopez, please, please, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me do this first. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a guest on my show. I really appreciate it. And also, close the show out with uh, some final thoughts. Well, I think you're right. You know, we often forget that there are ways to change, but sometimes we have to inspire the masses to change. And as I've seen in my neighborhood, and as, as your listeners have undoubtedly seen me do plenty of times, sometimes you have to draw the line in the stand and stick with it. You know, sometimes people just need hope that their leaders are going to stand up and say and do the right things and not waver to give them the strength to stand up too. And I've seen that in my communities, and I think we need to see that in the city of Chicago. That is where Mayor Johnson could be a great mayor if he was willing to stand up and do the right thing as opposed to simply saying the right thing in that moment. And we should expect that from him, demand that from him, because in the end, this is our city. This is our Chicago. And I don't think you, me, or any of your listeners want to give it up to individuals who don't love this city as much as we do. 